present. Mr. Durst is here with Mr. DeGarren, Mr. Chesnoff, Mr. Lewin, and his colleagues. You may resume your examination, Mr. DeGarren. Bob, why did you talk to Mr. Lewin in New Orleans in the jail? I was cold and I was. Hold on, hold on. Sorry. I was cold. And I was scared of the Louisiana prison system. I was hoping talking to John Lewin would get me out of Louisiana and to California. Your Honor, we pass the witness. You can cross-examine now, Mr. Lewin. Please. I might have a few questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Breathe. What's that? I'm having you breathe. I'm, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> no? Okay. Just get, get orient yourself to, to your space. Just, I got an extra legal package. No, that's okay. No, I don't want him bumping into our reporter. And just tell me when I can start, Your Honor. Yeah. Everybody ready? All right. You may, you may commence your uh, cross-examination you. of the witness, Mr. Lewin. So, Mr. Durst, um, Mr. DeGarren called you Bob. So you tell me, how do you want me to refer to you? I'm comfortable doing it however you want to do it. Do you want me to call you Bob? Do you want me to call you Mr. Durst? What would you prefer? How about sir? Okay, I'll call you sir. All right, sir. So, first of all, how do you feel this morning? Inmates who are going to be transported to court are woken up at 4 a.m. I am always tired. I got up a little earlier than that, so I can totally understand. Um, as you sit here, would you say, are you nervous? Is it a sense of anticipation? How do you feel? I feel relieved that I'm finally getting close to getting this over. And I feel nervous, of course. So it seems like by the answers that you gave, some of them on cross exam I'm sorry, on direct examination, it seems like you've been waiting for this cross-examination for a, a long time. You said, for instance, during your direct examination, at times you would almost seem bored and then you would make comments about my questioning you. So I'm just kind of wondering, when you were saying the comments, for instance, that um, you, know, you objected to one of Mr. DeGarren's questions on relevance, you asked him to ask me what questions I wanted to ask, were you being just humorous or I was just trying to understand that. I don't understand the question. So let me let me break it up. So during Mr. DeGarren's direct examination, as an example, you objected to one of his questions under relevance. Do you remember that? I remember there was a time I rejected to something based on relevance. I don't remember what it was. Right, no, it, well, it's kind of unusual. You've been in a courtroom a number of times. It's unusual for a defendant to object to a question for their own lawyer. So I was just trying to understand, were you just being, was it humorous or what did that mean? That was my sense of humor. And when you also asked Mr. DeGarren to ask me what questions I had, was that also your sense of humor as well? I don't remember asking Mr. DeGarren to ask you what questions you had. 
have you spent much time thinking about kind of what your plan is for how you're going to handle my questions? Yeah. And in terms of the plan that you've kind of, of thought about it, what have you decided your approach was going to be? I don't think I have an approach. I don't know what approach means. So I can't tell you how much time I've spent on this, but I probably hundreds, if not maybe a thousand hours um, yes, getting this. So, sir, as you sit here right now, I've got an outline that's roughly 200 pages. And the question that I have for you is this outline is designed to go through every inconsistency, every lie, every important question. If I can sustain. finish the question. No, sustain. So my question to you, Mr. Durst, is as you sit here right now, is there any approach that I can take with you that will encourage you to maybe provide more information than you have so far? Sustain. <clears throat> You understand, Mr. Durst, that there are certain rules for witnesses when they testify, correct? I understand that there are certain rules. I am not that familiar with what the rules are. Well, Specifically, well... Go ahead, I'm sorry. I thought you were finished. I interrupted you. Specifically... There seems to be a very thin line between when someone is making a speech, giving more information, I can't think of a word the lawyers use, when someone is giving more information than the question we call, calls for. There is a word that is repeatedly used that the witness is not allowed to, in essence, tell a story. Right, so you've been in front of Judge Windham now for approximately, it'll be five years in November. You've gone to a number of hearings and been in court repeatedly. So you understand that you are supposed to answer the questions that are asked and that you cannot simply add things that either yeah. aren't no, no, this is helpful. Are not responsive to the questions or are things that Judge Wyndham might have ruled that either you can't talk about or I can't ask you. You understand that, right? In fact, Mr. DeGarren at one point asked you a question, and your response was that, quote, I understand the rules of testifying. It just depends on how they are enforced. What did you mean by that answer? That's, that's what the judge is for. They, they kind of decide that answer. Um, would you agree that during your direct examination with Mr. DeGarren that you were able to hear, understand, and respond to just about all of his questions? Yes. 
if there's anything that I ask you, and I understand you're reading more than you're listening, or are you both? Are you listening to what I say and then reading it as well, or how are you getting the questions right now? Can you hear me? It takes me a while for it to register what you were saying. So you're more reading it than you are hearing what I'm saying, is that is that right? It's easier to read it than to listen to it. Okay, so um, I've got two hearing aids as well, so we're quite a combination. It's a little bit hard for me to hear you, so I'm going to try to listen as closely as I can, but there's a possibility that I might be asking you to repeat yourself. So if you can, when you're answering your questions, if you can kind of be as clear as you can, because sometimes your words run together, maybe just more for me. Do you think you can try and do that? I will try to do that. Now I asked you a moment ago about what your plans were and you have previously suggested in the past that if you testified that you were going to, in essence, kind of frustrate the process by responding to questions of mine that you didn't like by responding, I don't understand the question. Do you recall mentioning that that might be a, a tactic of yours previously? I don't recall mentioning that. So, can you give us your assurance that you will actually do your best to respond to my questions and that you will only say, I don't understand or I can't hear you, if that's in fact the case? Will you try and do that? I promise not to say, I don't hear you. I'm going to read what you said. Okay. Um, let's talk for a moment about your kind of physical and mental health. Um, there's been a lot of discussion as to whether or not you're physically and mentally able to kind of be here. And I just want to make sure you'd agree that your mind is pretty much as sharp as ever, right? Pretty much. And in terms of your physical condition, you basically live in a hospital, correct? Correct. Um, in the past, you've talked about what you consider to be the outstanding medical care that you've received uh, at the, the county jail, including them finding, diagnosing, and successfully treating your bladder cancer, correct? I feel that I am getting medical care that is as good as money could buy. And obviously, you're not at the Mayo Clinic or at Baylor. There's a difference between being in custody. But, but overall, um, you've indicated you feel like the individuals who are taking care of you are competent and are, and are trying to, as best they can, attend to your needs, correct? Correct. And pretty much since the day you got to Los Angeles, with a few minor exceptions, you've been housed in what is basically a hospital, right? Correct. So obviously, it's very weird calling you sir, but I'll do it. Um, uh, obviously, sir, you and I have, we've met and we've spoken before, correct? Correct. We had a long conversation on March 15, 2015 in the New Orleans jail. Do, do, you, re, do you have a clear memory of that conversation? No. Um, were you, you were in court when it was played. Were you listening to it? Yes. If you remember, 
the conversation wasn't quite as long as I would have liked because it got interrupted when you had to go to court on a Sunday morning. Do you remember that? Oh, it ended when I went to court. Yes, the interview ended Sunday morning. We were speaking and they finally took you out. We were still discussing things. Do you recall that? You were still asking me questions. When they took me to court, Dick DeGarren was there, and he told me I should shut up. So I told you I was going to shut up. <laughs> That's the time you decided to listen to your lawyers. There have been many other times where your lawyers have told you what you should do, and you pretty much have done what you want to do, right? Except for the thing with Andrew Jarecki. I tend to do what my lawyers ask me to do. So you mentioned on direct examination that the reason that you spoke to me was that um, you were looking for a plea bargain. Uh, and just want to make sure that's, um, that's not where you are today, correct? No, what I want today is to be acquitted. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, just for a moment, about the conditions. You've talked about how bad the jail was and how dirty it was. And I changed into my suit in the bathroom, so that is not a clean place. I agree with you. But you would agree that nobody forced you to have that conversation, right? I agree, I did it myself. And would you also agree that um, we were kind and decent to you? We offered to get you a blanket, we gave you coffee. Is that a, a pretty fair assessment? Yes, that's a fair assessment. Would you also agree that during the interview, um, I wasn't beating you up or screaming at you, etc. We were pretty much just having a, a conversation, right? Correct. So, I want to kind of get into, briefly, the issue of your memory. Um, if I were to ask you, how would you describe your memory overall? Well, you do on a scale of 1 to 100. And if 100 is perfect and 1 is terrible, I would think I'm a 60 or a 70. So do you think, if we're talking about scales, would you agree that you don't just have a, a good memory for obscure things and dates, you have a pretty incredible memory? Is that a fair statement or would you disagree? you mean by incredible? Well, during I your direct... to say, uh, if you take a hundred people and line them up by perfect memory to terrible memory, I would be in a 60 or a 70. Do you think that would be true for if we had all those people age 78? pretty good memory for a 78 year old. Well, in fact, you testified in direct examination to the minimum wage in Vermont in the early 70s, the completion dates and addresses of Durst skyscrapers, the name of the fraternity house where you stayed in the summer of 1966, the time of day you first met Susan Berman, and even the name and spelling of Dykstra Pool which, unlike Beverly, you spelled it right without an E. You agree you were able to remember all those details. Is that correct? I remember all those things, yes. And would you agree that some of those details were pretty innocuous and not necessarily important? 
I think the reason I remember them was because they were important to me. Would you also agree that as a 78-year-old man now, that as good as your memory is today, it was probably better when you were a little bit younger. Is that a fair statement? I'm sure it was better when I was younger. And would you also agree, Mr. Durst, that all of the marijuana probably hasn't helped your memory either? Marijuana is very bad for memory. I imagine all controlled substances are bad for memory. So without the marijuana, you would probably be off the scale. You'd be over 100, right? Right. So you've also testified in this case to very specific memories about, as an example, the length and the color of coat Kathy was wearing when you had the argument after she returned from Gilberta's on January 31st, but you allegedly remember almost nothing about the details of Morris Black's dismemberment. You would agree that's a true statement I've just made, is that right? I remember almost nothing of Morris Black's dismemberment. I never think about dismembering Morris Black. It was a terrible, horrible event, and I would not let myself think about it if somehow it came into my thoughts. Mr. Durst, do you know when I say the term selective memory, do you understand what that means? Well, I listen to a lady psychologists talk about selective memory and broadly you rem remember certain well I mean I thought I knew what it meant before the lady testified I got very confused listening to her define what selective memory means are you referring to Dr. Loftus Yes. Right. You didn't just listen, you paid for it. My trust pay for her. So you understand, Mr. Durst, that there's a difference between what somebody chooses to remember and what they choose to forget. Would you agree? I would agree with that at any time. The thought of Morris Black comes into my mind. I force it out. But you would agree there are other important details in this case that do not involve dismemberment, where you have gone back and forth and given different answers to the same question. Would you agree? Yes. Would you also concede that there's a difference between having a good memory and having a truthful memory? That they're not the same thing? I would not know how to define. I do not know the difference between a good memory and a truthful memory. Well, wouldn't you agree, Mr. Durst, that a good memory means that you actually remember what happened a truthful memory means that when you talk about it, you actually describe the memories you have. Does that make sense? No. So you don't understand the difference between having a memory of something, it's in your mind, you know what happened, versus what you actually say about what you remember. You agree those can be two different things, right? Yes. So I want to talk briefly, Mr. DeGuerin covered early in his direct examination, he talked about some of your relationships growing up. Do you recall some of those questions? Yes. 
I'm not sure what period of time you're referring to. Well, I'm just asking, do you remember Mr. DeGuerin basically started questioning, he went back to the time when you were a very little boy. Do you recall some of those questions that he asked you about growing up in your family? I recall some of the questions he asked me about when I was a little boy. And on direct examination, you testified that you were not very close to your dad. But you've also testified that he was constantly pushing you to work in the family business. Are both those things true? Yes. Would you describe your dad as having been too hard on you growing up? or having been too lenient? Lenient. Yeah. Isn't it fair to say, Mr. Durst, that the problem with your dad was not that he was too tough on you, it's that he was just not tough enough? Yes. Would you also agree that kind of growing up and even as an adult, you've never had to really be accountable for your actions other than obviously you went on trial in Galveston, you're on trial here, but in the way you've lived your life, fair to say you pretty much do what you want. I think it's a bad question. What well, is pretty much do what you want? I obey the traffic rules. I don't speed. Well, would you agree, and I'm going to go into it in more detail, that, you know, as an example, um, if you don't want to wait in line to pay for something, you don't. If you don't want to show up at work when other people show up at work, you don't. You pretty much the way that you've approached your life has been, I want to do it this way and that's what you do. Is that a, a fair statement? No. Tell me what's unfair about that statement or where it's wrong. When I buy something, I pay for it. In unusual circumstances, I steal it. Well, I mean, as an example, I was going to get to this later, but um, there's a story that you tell, this comes from you, of how you're waiting in line at LAX, there's a long line, you're just going to buy a bottle of water, and you decide, one, the line's too long, and two, it's too expensive, and your response was, in essence, what are they going to do, chase me? I don't think they're going to chase me, and you just took it, right? Is that a true statement, a true story? That's a true statement. And would you agree, it's not that you didn't understand that what you're doing was wrong. It's just that you decided that I just don't have to follow those rules. Well, you are taking one instance of me taking a bottle of water instead of standing in line while I was waiting for my plane to leave and asking a very broad question as if I never, ever pay for anything. Oh. And that's not correct. Oh, and just to be clear, I, th th I'm not saying that at all, but another example would be, um, you're a very wealthy man, correct? Correct. Um, early on, you ended up, after you worked for Vista, you applied for food stamps, and, and you've told this story. This comes from you, correct? I told that story because Andrew Jarecki asked me to tell that story. Right, but he asked you to tell a story that was true. That wasn't a made-up story, correct? As part of working for Vista, about a third of our salary was in food stamps. But in order to get that third of the salary and get the food stamps, 
we all had to go through the process of applying for food stamps. So I applied for food stamps along with the other 23 people in my program. Mr. Durst, though, you were a multimillionaire and you were aware you were not eligible or in need of food stamps, right? I was not in need, but I don't think I could have continued to be a VISTA if I did not apply for food stamps. The whole idea of the VISTA program I was in was experiencing what low-income people have to do to get the benefits that the legislature has legislated that they should receive. So are, are you now saying that the reason that you lied to get food stamps was because it was some requirement for you to be working for VISTA? Is that your testimony now? Yes. You are aware, you've watched the trial pretty closely, right, Mr. Durst? I watched what trial? This trial. I've been sitting. I'm just asking if you've been paying attention and watching it closely. I'm sitting here paying attention to the trial. So you're aware that oftentimes when I ask a witness a question, I have a clip that I say whatever Mr. Milius puts it up. So are you aware as you sit here, Mr. Durst, I assume you're aware that there's a clip of you saying that you applied to food stamps because you like the feeling of beating the government. You, you've heard that clip repeatedly, correct? Andrew asked me to say that, and I said that because Andrew asked me to say it. And you would agree, Mr. Durst, that the first time you ever said to anybody that I made that comment about food stamps because Andrew Jarecki told me to do it is right here, right now, correct? That's not correct. I've said it repeatedly. Well. I asked you about it during our 2015 interview, correct? And you didn't say at all, hey, that's not true. Um, Andrew Jarecki made me say it, did you? Andrew Jarecki did not make me say it. Andrew Jarecki gave me hints as to what he wanted me to say, to say, and I do not recall discussing food stamps during our interview in 2015. Well, we'll get there. So um, you would agree you're a bright person? I consider myself to be smart, but I do not consider myself to be very smart, and I am definitely not very, very smart. So, Mr. Durst, can you explain why, in an interview that you knew was being videotaped, that you would take hints from Mr. Jarecki to make yourself as a multimillionaire, look like you were taking food stamps from people of need if it wasn't true?
I asked Andrew Jarecki to interview me and to do a show about me. I was hoping that Andrew Jarecki would do a show that showed me as I was overall, as a good person. Andrew convinced me that in order to make myself interesting, I needed to say certain things, certain things. One of the things had to do with food stamps. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, we'll get to that later on the examination, but I was asking about your dad, and I want to go back to that. Um, even with respect to your conduct at the Durst organization, is it fair to say that no matter what you did or didn't do, how inappropriate you were or disrespectful, that your dad never held you accountable when you worked for him, did he? Is that correct? I'm reading your question. Okay. Dad held me accountable for what I did for the Durst organization. You've heard your brother Douglas and Nick Chavin testify that the portrayal of your dad in All Good Things was not accurate, that it made him look extremely cold and domineering, and that that wasn't who he was. Do you agree with your brother Douglas and Nick on that issue, or do you think the portrayal was a realistic and fair portrayal of your dad? I don't recall the movie All Good Things making Dad look cold. I don't recall, I mean the movie showed Dad giving his son, me, who was played by Ryan Gosling, running Bruggles in Times Square. I thought the movie showed a relationship between Seymour Durst and Robert Durst as, as reasonably caring. You would agree your dad was neither cold or domineering, correct? Correct. So another area that Mr. Guerin spent a lot of time asking about was your mother's death in 1950. And obviously, Mr. Durst, the loss of your mom when you were seven years old, that's a tragedy almost beyond description, and it's understandable that it had a, a lifelong effect on you, but would you agree that your siblings lost their mother too, and none of them is in any way similar to how you are? correct? I don't understand the question. Well, you're... I mean, my siblings obviously lost their mother too. But what the effect on them is, I have no idea. You're not blaming your adult conduct, the things you've done on the loss of your mother, are you? No. Now, you also testified on direct that as a little boy, it was always, this was your quote, Mommy and Bobby against Daddy and Douglas. Is that right? Yes. And you related 
that you all would play Go Fish, Uno, and Frisbee, and that it was always you and your mom on one side and Douglas and your dad on the other. Is that right? That's right. Were you and your, your dad ever on the same team, or was it always divided up this way? I have difficulty with always. There must have been times when we were playing goldfish that I ended up on the same team as Dad. But as a general statement, we were always on other t opposite teams. When you think about these memories of the four of you playing Go Fish, Uno, throwing the Frisbee, are those painful or are those happy memories for you? Happy memories. And is it fair to say that these images involving these activities with your mom and your father and Douglas, that they're kind of indelibly imprinted in your mind? Yes. And I'm going to assume, because I asked you earlier about how you remembered certain details, and you said, well, those details were very important to me, so I would assume that you could probably close your eyes right now, and you could literally see the four of you playing Go Fish and Uno, throwing the Frisbee. Is that accurate? Yes. Now, your mom died in 1950, is that correct? Correct. Mr. Durst, if I were to tell you that the Frisbee was not invented until 1957, seven years after your mom died, what would be your response? What is a Frisbee? Frisbee. Frisbee, you testified on direct examination that you have memories and you just now... A Frisbee. Frisbee. I don't remember testifying that I played with a Frisbee as a little boy. So, I want you to assume for a moment, Mr. Durst, that you testified to this jury on direct examination that you would have these teams, your mom and you on one side, Douglas and your dad on the other side, and that you would play Go Fish Uno and throw the frisbee. Are you saying you don't remember saying that? I remember saying that we were on different sides playing goldfish and Uno. I don't remember saying we were on different sides playing frisbee. Mr. Milius, can you please play that clip? I don't have the number right in front of me because I have it in a different section. You know, while he is saying that, may we approach very briefly? Yeah. May I continue, Your Honor? Yes. Mr. Durst. You mentioned playing Uno as well. Would it surprise you to find out that the game of Uno was not invented until 1971? It would surprise me, yes. Well, I want you to assume for a moment that the Frisbee was not invented until 1957 and that Uno was not invented until 1971. If that were true, you would agree that 
these memories that you've described, these emotional memories, cannot be accurate. Is that correct? Correct. And would you further agree, Mr. Durst, that if that's true, that no other way to say it, it was just a lie? Correct? I remember playing goldfish. I remember playing you know. And I remember saying that. As of now, I don't remember saying that we played frisbee. Well, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll end up playing the clip for you, but I want you to assume for a moment that that's what, what you said. My question to you would be, you've said these memories are imprinted in your mind. You've said they're very important to you, that you can close your eyes and you can literally see them happening right now. So I'm trying to understand with your incredible memory, how is it that you're able to have an image of playing two games that were not invented while your mother was still alive? Can you explain that? First of all, I do not describe my memory as being incredible. And if I'm wrong about when Uno was invented, then I've got the wrong game, the wrong name for the games that we play. Would you agree, Mr. Durst, that given the specificity with which you've discussed things like minimum wage in Vermont and the spelling Dykstra Pool, et cetera, that would it be a fair way to look at what you've done? Would it be fair for somebody to say, you know what, that sounds like Bob Durst could have been lying. Would that be a fair way to look at it or do you think that would be an unfair characterization? That would be unfair. Why would that be unfair? Because there are specific things that I remember and lots of things I don't remember. But you would agree that you were very clear this was a memory you talked about on direct examination with Mr. DeGarren, that you're the one who mentioned these images and that you're the one who just said on cross-examination you agreed that the memories were kind of indelibly imprinted in your mind, correct? Correct. Mr. Durst, wasn't that story, which cannot be true, simply used to engender sympathy with this jury? Wasn't that what that, that was about? I'm not sure which story you're referring to. I'm referring to the story of you playing with your mom before she tragically died when you were a little boy and your memory of playing Uno and the Frisbee when that's an impossibility when it couldn't have happened. That that memory, you discussing it, was just an attempt to engender sympathy with this jury. Isn't that what that was about? I was answering the question. Okay, let's talk about your mother's death for a moment. Um, 
it's your testimony that you saw her fall or jump from the roof. Is that right? That's not right. Okay, so you're saying you did not see it. I saw her on the roof. I did not see her jump or fall. Who was it that directed you to say hi to Mommy while she was outside on the roof? My mother's father, my maternal grandfather. And I want to assume that that must be a particularly cogent memory for you. Is that right? Well, first, your question misstates the facts. I was not directed to say hi to Mommy, because Mommy was on the roof, and I was inside in the upstairs hallway looking at her outside of a closed window. I was directed to wave at Mommy, which I did. Right, so Mr. Durst, in asking that question, I'll be honest with you, I deliberately changed what you said to see if you would answer and correct it. So it, it's a pretty good memory and a pretty solid memory you have, is that right? On the question, That's a solid memory you have, you and your grandfather, correct? Yes. However, on December 11, 2010, page 137, lines 6 through 17, did you say the following to Mr. Jarecki? But that night, and I'm pretty, pretty sure, I hadn't even fallen asleep yet, and my father came and got me, and he said, I'd like, come on over here. I want you to, you know, see Mommy. And we looked out a hall window and out onto the roof, and there was Mommy, and I waved at Mommy. I don't know if she saw me. It never went through my mind that what, what is she doing out on the roof in her nighty? Yeah, and it just didn't focus on me. There's Mommy. Wave at Mommy. Okay, now go on back to bed. Took me back to my room, and I fell asleep. Can you explain why you told Andrew Jarecki that it was your father? I misspoke. Well, does that sound like, Mr. Durst, given the powerful nature of that memory, does that sound like something that you would misspeak about? Well, if what you're telling me is accurate, then I did misspeak about it. What if I told you, Mr. Durst, that that wasn't the only time you, quote, misspoke in your interview with Mr. Jarecki? December 11, 2010, page 144, lines 3 through 7. Question by Mr. Jarecki. And when you look back on that, or you talk to your father about it, did you think that by bringing you to look at her, and you respond, well, he was bringing me so she could see me. That's what he always said. Is that another misspoke situation, Mr. Durst? I think, I don't think that's a misquote. Dad did show me Mom on the roof, but by then I was standing in the driveway. The problem is, is that the quote, Mr. Durst, talks about your father 
having woken you up, that he came and got you. And the only difference is when you testified in court the other day, you couldn't remember which lie you had originally told. Isn't that what happened? Overall. Neither of them were lies. It's now the it's now the uh, lunch hour. We'll return at 1.30. Do not converse among yourselves or with anyone else on any subject connected with this case. Do not form or express any opinion on the case. We'll see you at 1.30.